So uh, welcome to our second uh, summer school by the Growth Project. Uh, Growth is the National Science Foundation Partnership in International Research and Education. Um, so we are a partnership of uh, about 16 different countries um, that do time domain astronomy. Okay. So uh, the goal of this first module is just a warm-up module, is just to get you guys excited about time domain astronomy, and get you motivated for all the hard work you're going to do over the next three days. Um, so uh, the idea is just to, get, just to get you excited about the science. That's it. Okay. Um, this is the only module probably that you're allowed to fall asleep in. Um, anything else and you'll be totally lost. Okay. So, um, so if you need to take a nap, now is your chance. All other modules, you need to really, really be paying full attention because the way the next 11 modules are organized for you is that there's a 30-minute lecture and then a 90-minute or 120-minute, depending on how complicated the module is, hands-on working session. And we're going to try to get all of you up to speed working through these modules, okay? So the way this will work is that we have uh, seven TAs who are the stars of the show here. Uh, they are the most familiar, most deeply familiar with the modules and the content, and they can help you more than anybody else in the room. So if you raise your right hand, that means you have a question for the person standing in front, and you want everybody to hear your question. If you raise your left hand, that means you want help, one-on-one -on -one help from one of the TAs. So what the TAs will be doing during the hands-on working sessions is looking for everybody who has their left hand raised, okay, and then going to them one-on-one -on -one and helping them. So the modules are structured that there are breakpoints throughout the module. So you'll work through a piece of code, try to write, write a few lines by yourself. When you reach a breakpoint, then we'll pause, we'll try to get everybody up to speed, and then continue. Okay? Um, so do, if anything, anything is causing any problems on your laptop, anything's not compiling, anything's crashing, we all did the check-ins, and the check-ins went very smoothly. So I'm very proud of all of you. You did your homework. That's fantastic. Um, but let's make sure that as we work through this, if any issues come up, just raise your left hand and one of the TAs will, will come find you. Okay, um, so let's get started. So this is a really, really fun time. Oops, no slides. Let's see if you can get some slides going. All right, we have slides. That's good. Bug one, fixed. <laughs> okay. Um, and they're totally allowed to laugh during the school. That's, that's totally legit and allowed here, okay? So, um, so we live in an era of multi-messenger astrophysics. So time domain astrophysics now has multiple dimensions here where we are learning about the universe not only through the dimension of time and time across the electromagnetic spectrum, but also um, through different messengers, different physics messengers, so to speak, such as gravitational waves, neutrinos, high energy cosmic rays, etc. Right? So there's a whole bunch of acronyms on this slide. The point is that there's all kinds of new machines, new discovery engines that are coming online as we speak um, to help us tap um, this potential that the, the universe has to offer of understanding it in, in its dynamic form, understanding things as they change. And in the center of the electromagnetic spectrum, in the uh, optical and infrared piece of the electromagnetic spectrum, one of the revolutions that's making this possible is the advent of wide field imaging. Okay? So um, thanks to Moore's Law and all the hardworking electrical engineers um, who don't even who don't really do this for astronomy but do this for electronics, which is a very thriving industry, um, CCDs have gotten cheaper and cheaper. And it's been possible to build very wide format CCDs. In fact, um, with this Wiki Transient facility that was commissioned a year ago, uh, the entire wafer scale CCDs, instead of taking a wafer and chopping it up into little pieces to make your detector, the entire wafer can be a detector in and of its own right. And we can make detectors that are 47 square degrees that are completely affordable. Um, in the infrared, uh, we just commissioned uh, less than a year ago an infrared camera called Gattini, which has a field of view of 25 square degrees. So both in the optical um, and the infrared, just on one mountaintop as an example, we've been able to now start imaging the sky at a rapid speed of a few thousand square degrees um, per hour. So can somebody tell me how many square degrees are there in the night sky? Okay, I'm just going to stop here if, I don't, if nobody raises their hand. How many square degrees are there in the night sky? Mansi. I don't know. 
Okay, um, Andy. How much? Close enough. Yes, excellent. How many can we actually see? So, four by of this guy is about 42 to 43,000 square degrees. How many can we see from a mountain top at a given, on a given night? About half of it. The other half is under, the, under us, right? Okay, so that's about 20 something thousand square degrees. Now, some of it is a bit too low on the side, too close to the horizon. So, something like maybe 17, 18,000 square degrees. So, if you're imaging 4,000 square degrees per hour, in four hours, you run out of sky to observe, right? So, this means that you have a very rapid mapping speed where you image the sky over and over again, multiple times a night, uh, to try and make a movie of the sky and look for things that change. Similarly, in the infrared, we have this uh, new nimble machine that you can talk to Matt and Kishale here. Um, this is their favorite topic to talk about. You can spend hours and hours talking to them about this, this telescope called Palmar Gatini IR, which is again imaging the entire night sky, night after night, in the infrared, in the J-band, okay, so beyond the optical spectrum. Now, um, close to the optical and the infrared is the ultraviolet, and this is where astronomers really haven't even bothered to start exploring the wide field um, ultraviolet sky. But there's some really brave people in the room, in particular Dr. Brad Senko here, who just submitted a proposal on August 1st to launch um, a wide field in ultraviolet telescope in space. Because this is something that's impossible to do from the ground. But to start mapping and exploring the dynamic infrared sky uh, from space. So talk to him if you want to know more about the hot, hot and dynamic universe. So, um, as I mentioned, you know, some of these facilities, my favorite mountaintop is Palomar Observatory, uh, which is very close to where you're going tonight, which is to Robert's favorite mountaintop, uh, Mount Laguna Observatory. Um, and you'll see not one, but many, many different telescopes. Um, and in particular, this one is what I'm most excited about, which is every scope. So, this is a telescope on this, on this half dome with lots and lots of telescopes inside. So, each of these is a telescope here. So this can image the entire sky that's accessible from Mount Laguna every two minutes. Okay, we're talking about 4,000 square degrees an hour. This is now the whole sky to about 16th or 17th bank every two minutes. So, um, so again, just pushing the frontier to faster and faster time scales to explore the dynamic universe. Now, um, these are all the discovery engines where the growth project comes in is that it's a global relay of observatories watching transients happen. Um, it's a cookie acronym, just many fun acronyms in astronomy. Um, but the idea is that we have telescopes around the world and we try and beat sunrise, right? So say you make a discovery at uh, Palomar or Laguna Mountain in California and the sun rises here. Um, you need to go west. Now west is the Pacific Ocean, that's not a great place to be. So you go to the island of Hawaii and then Japan, then Taiwan, then India, in Israel, etc. Right? So that you have this ring of telescopes around the world, and as night sets in each, on each of these mountaintops, you can continue to collect data. Um, and in fact, there are radio telescopes that we have all over the world in our collaboration as well, which don't even care about sunrise or sunset. They can observe just about any time in the day or night, uh, which is fantastic. Um, now, if you have telescopes around the world, it means it's a team that never sleeps. Okay, <laughs> so somebody is always on their toes um, and looking at beautiful data as it comes in. And the powerhouse of such a, such a network is really the young people. It's really the students and postdocs. And these are the people who are going to be uh, your TAs for this, um, for this summer school. So, so learn as much as you can from these wonderful people. Um, so our tools are an essential part of time domain astronomy, of discovery and follow-up. Um, so about um, a couple of years ago, what we did was we put together something called the Growth Follow-Up Marshall. And I use V in a very grand way. V is actually a couple of undergraduate post pack students between undergrad and grad school and a few grad students and postdocs that con contributed to the code. So this is a bunch of really, really young people who put together this fantastic um, piece of software uh, that can help coordinate d discovery streams that are coming in. So 
thousands of alerts coming in from discovery streams and deciding which of these alerts to send to which telescope, which telescopes gets data, how, get all the data from the follow-up telescopes back to the central module, um, and then outsource that, uh, that output into what you need to write a paper. And one of the key things that we use in any sort of such alert filtering system is machine learning. And one of your modules during the summer school um, is going to be taught by our um, by senior staff scientist Ashish Abel on this particular topic. So um, the streams can enable science across many different um, dimensions, time domain science across many different dimensions. So um, uh, one of your modules will be taught by uh, postdoc on GA. Um, this will be session 10, and this will be about asteroids. This will be about moving objects in our own solar system. And just a few weeks ago, Quan Chi was all over the news uh, because of a fun asteroid uh, that he found. So he's going to tell you more about that uh, in the lecture. Um, you'll also have a session about um, stars in the own Milky Way um, that are varying and doing um, you know, different things, varying in brightness in different ways. So this here is an um, eclipsing white dwarf, white dwarf binary. So it's two dead stars, two white dwarfs, which are remnants of, of uh, very low mass stars that are going around each other, eclipsing each other in this big dip, and doing this in 6.9 minutes. Okay, so the number of times is these two white dwarfs will spin around each other will be, um, you know, at least five by the time I finish. Um, and in this particular case, uh, you know, Kevin Burge, who's a grad student, was especially excited because he saw the period decreasing. So these two white dwarf, uh, this white dwarf binary is going to merge in less than a Hubble time. So you can actually measure not just the period, but the decrease in the period here. So you'll hear any more about that uh, by uh, the on session. There are many, many uh, different aspects of um, time domain science um, that I can tell you about. Um, so it's hard to pick which one um, to uh, to share with you. Uh, but the one I think that sort of ties together two different aspects of the summer school uh, remains this event from August 17th, 2017, um, which I hope everybody has heard of. Who knows what, I'm, what, what happened on August 17th, 2017. Uh, Brad, you're not allowed to raise your hand. <laughs> okay, uh, who has not heard about it? Okay, excellent. This is going to be super easy. Okay, so um, on August 17th, 2017, uh, the cool thing that happened was that uh, nowadays, I mean, this is, we are now living in the third serving run of advanced LIGO and Virgo, these fantastic interferometers um, that are continuously increasing in sensitivity. And every week we hear um, of two binary black holes merging, right? It's become so routine that I don't even wake up when I see a tweet, when I see a text message that says two binary black holes merged. You know, even <laughs> they don't wake up either. They go they, they go right back to bed, um, and it's two binary black holes merging. Um, on August 17, 2017, the special thing that happened was that two neutron stars merged, okay? And they formed a black hole, but the fact that they were neutron stars, so who knows what's a neutron star? David. Uh, right, so, so mass star, so massive star ends its life, but goes off as a core collapse supernova, and the remnant is, is a very, very dense stellar remnant called a neutron star. Um, so why is it why is it fun if a, if two neutron stars merge? Why is that better than two black holes? The black holes are really black. There's no light, right? Uh, right. So they have an electromagnetic counterpart to this. So from the gravitational waves, you can learn all kinds of fun things about the neutron star state and the individual masses of the the black holes. But what's special about this event that happened on August 17, 2017, was that it lit up the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And what this told us was that if you want a, a, a budding time domain astronomer today, then you really need to be wavelength agnostic. You need to be able to be flexible enough to understand data from any wavelength, analyze it quickly. You need to be on your toes. These things fade very quickly. So you really need to have a toolkit to analyze data across the electromagnetic spectrum. And one of our most important goals for the next three days is to give you that toolkit so that you're ready to analyze data across the entire electromagnetic spectrum, each of which holds a different piece of 
astrophysics and astrochemistry uh, to try and understand what we just saw, okay? So um, in gravitational waves, it would be the longest, loudest and closest signal that we had ever observed. Um, the fun for the astronomers began 1.7 seconds later when the Fermi satellite and the integral satellite saw this blip of emission here in the gamma rays. Gamma rays are now the most energetic piece of the electromagnetic spectrum. And just for a couple of seconds, a couple of seconds later, there was this blip of emission. Um, so this began the chase of trying to identify which galaxy, which particular point in the sky hosted this event. Because gravitational waves and gamma rays, as fantastic as they are, are very poor at localizing a signal and telling you exactly where something happened. So the search for exactly which galaxy and which point in that galaxy and which particular two st neutron stars in that galaxy um, went off um, was successfully carried out for August 17, 2017. And um, uh, Kilonova, the infrared and optical counterpart, was identified to be this red dot in this image um, that hadn't been um, you know, seen before, that just went off right after the event. And there'll be an entire module um, by, oops, by Leo Singer and Dave Cook on, that tells you about how you can use galaxy catalogs to try and find um, the, the electromagnetic counterpart in a very efficient way here. Now, this was back in about almost two years ago now, right? Almost exactly two years ago, uh, give or take a few days. Uh, what's happening nowadays with um, the third observing run of advanced LIGO is that the interferometers are more and more sensitive and the localizations are much, much poorer. So um, in the two events so far that have hosted some sort of neutron star, this was two neutron stars, this was possibly a neutron star black hole, the localization of the first one was 10,000 square degrees. Now that you know how many square degrees are in the sky, you know that's a pie of the sky. That's almost a quarter of the sky, right? So this is a very, very coarse localization compared to the 40 square degrees that you had for um, the August 17th event. And this one, for the very first time, at least at some chance, that what we are seeing is a neutron star black hole merger. Now, we don't even know whether neutron star black hole systems exist, right? At least neutrons and neutron star, we've seen binary pulsars in our own galaxy. We know these things exist. We know about, about a half a dozen to a dozen systems in our, in our own galaxy, which are two pulsars going around each other, there are two neutron stars. Now, theoretically, okay, neutrons have black hole systems should exist, but we've never seen it before. So in this particular case, um, this is called a candidate neutron star black hole merger. LIGO still hasn't decided whether this is, um, you know, I mean, ha hasn't put a significance level uh, to give this, uh, uh, to confirm or deny the claim yet. They're still busily analyzing their data. But this neutron star black hole merger was localized to something like 2,000 square degrees. And as I mentioned to you, growth has this network of telescopes that are imaging this, right? So we got the localization 1.1 hour um, after the merger from the gravitational waves. And at 1.5 hours, at that time it was nighttime in India, it was about 8 in the morning Pacific time, the Growth India telescope started mapping the celestial pole. Um, then the sun set in Chile and the dark energy camera that Igor Andreoni here and another postdoc, Danny Goldstein, um, our PI is on a program there. This is a telescope in Chile. They started mapping this area. Uh, then at Palomar, um, Gattini mapped this area. Then this Wiki Transient Facility mapped this area. And the localization got updated uh, with LIGO. But the point being that you can map this entire area to try to find a potential candidate counterpart. And once you find this candidate counterpart, that's when the, fu the fun of having a whole network of telescopes around the world really, really gets in because this thing in the ultraviolet could fade in minutes to hours. Um, in the optical, maybe you have a few days. In the infrared, maybe you have a few weeks. But something is fading very, very quickly and you really need to beat the rotation of the Earth and the fact that it's not dark everywhere all the time to, um, to try and collect data. So this is a movie of, again, GW 170817 and a worldwide effort, I think that involved 70 telescopes um, on the ground and seven in space um, that, under, that collected data. There were over 3,000 astronomers that got involved. Just about anybody with a telescope stopped whatever they were doing and looked at this position in sky to collect data. It was absolutely fantastic, absolutely majestic. 
And of course, everybody needs to know how to collect data from telescopes. How do you figure out whether it's day or night? How do you figure out whether the target is actually overhead? And you can collect data or not. And that's what Professor Quibby here will tell you in growth, growth um, school session number, number four. OK, um, so uh, again, focusing now on the astrophysics. So what do we learn after we collect all this data, right? So in my mind, there are two big questions that this one event, GW170817, was able to answer. The first one is nucleosynthesis. So the question of whether neutron star mergers are indeed the long sought sites of heavy element production. Um, so as of a couple of years ago, uh, we knew that most of the universe is a very boring place. So it just has hydrogen and helium, nothing much more than that. Supernovae uh, produce this set of light blue and dark blue elements, depending on whether you're type 1 or type 2 supernova. But there's still much debate on, on where all the heavy elements in the periodic table, all these things shown in yellow, which are supposed to be formed by our process nucleosynthesis, where is it actually made? Some people argued that um, you know, supernovae with jets can make it. Some people argue that with the neutron star mergers that we've never seen um, or caught red-handed before um, is where these heavy elements get synthesized. Um, and what was amazing about this, um, this particular event is that if you combine the data that all these telescopes were collecting around the world, this is the growth um, light curve, you see again that this blue emission and the red emission lasts for longer time. And what this is telling you is whatever elements are being synthesized are things with a high opacity. So opacity means that the light is actually taking a long time to get out of the system, right? And this is something you may expect. So I don't know how much high school chemistry is still familiar, but by the time you get to this part of the periodic table, you're not just filling the S, B, D, but the F shells, right? So um, as you fill out more and more of the shells, um, then you have many, many more configurations. Things go as the, the quantum number factorial, right? So you have millions of transitions for some of these elements of where the electron possibly be. So if, you ha if you're trying to um, look at radioactive decay of these elements and look at the photons escaping, they can get caught in many different pathways before they actually escape. So the, the net effect is that light is very opaque and the emission is much more longer lived in the infrared um, wave bands. So what you see is that the, the blue emission is brilliant but, la but lasts for a very short time. Um, the red emission is much longer lived. And trying to get just these points on a, on a light curve is what you'll spend three growth sessions on. Okay, this is really, really not, not easy. Um, so you need to take your images, figure out how to reduce those images, subtract those images, do photometry on those images. So we've broken it down into three different sessions for you. And uh, growth school sessions two, three, and five will help you uh, figure out how to make your own light curve. And then once you have data across um, the, the electromagnetic spectrum like this, you can combine it into what's called bolometric luminosity. Right? So it was a total amount of light that's coming in at all these different wavelengths and plot that as a function of time and then start comparing that to different models to see whether this matches anything uh, that you may expect. Um, and in this particular case, it's just a beautiful fit to uh, radioactive decay of the heavy elements in the periodic table. Um, so um, both the luminosity and the rate of decline is a very, very good match to that. So um, independent analyses by many different teams, not just a growth team, came to the same answer that no matter what details you quibble about, there's no question that um, heavy elements were synthesized. And furthermore, um, if you look at uh, the spe a spectrum of this event, then you see these two broad features yeah, so this is now emission as a function of wavelength in the infrared wave bands. So this is now 10,000 angstrom to 17,000 angstrom. So well beyond what you can see with your eyes here. And the fact that you see these big broad bumps is because of lines being blended together. So you have lots of line transitions all moving at high velocity. They get blended together in these broad bumps. And red is a model from 2013 and black is data. And it's amazing that they look anything like each other, given the large number of transitions that I just described to you happen with these elements. And Professor Quimby will go into, um, will teach you how to take 
spectroscopic data. We are taking the light and dispersing it through some dispersive element, a prism, a grating, a grism, and then how to take that data and, and convert it into the spectrum and interpret it um, to try and understand what the astrochemistry here is. Um, this is a beautiful spectroscopic sequence obtained by the VLT telescope um, that ESO has in Chile, uh, where you can see how the spectrum evolved as a function of time. So it again started off with something very hot and blue, then had these very distinctive features um, that were formed. And but so to, to this day, you know, people agree that heavy elements were synthesized, but people disagree on you know which of the heavy elements were synthesized. Was it only the lightest star process elements? Was it the light, medium, and heavy, only the heaviest? Right? There's a lot of debate on what, what the, um, the relative distribution of these R process elements were. So um, in particular, if you now look at, let's just ask the question that if you look around you, right, you see this desk, this chair, you see people. If you, take, if you just look around you in the solar neighborhood and you say how much of each element is present, right, what is the relative abundance of each element? as a function of atomic mass number. And you focus on the elements. You focus on these elements with mass numbers between 70 uh, to say 200 here. Then you have three abundance peaks um, in the solar neighborhood. And then there's this little bump in here, which is the lanthanide bump. So it's, it's quite complicated. If you look at accumulative distribution, actually majority of the elements that we see around us are the, in the lightest R process peak. So this is where silver is, right? There's a reason why silver is cheaper than gold, which is all the way in this, uh, which is all the way on the right here. There's very little of it in the solar neighborhood. So the question is that, okay, um, we saw these two neutrons as merged. We saw them form heavy elements, there's no question. But how much of which one? Were they formed in the same relative ratio that we see in the solar neighborhood, which would suggest that these are the only sites of our process nucleosynthesis, or was it a different ratio? And are there many different sites of our process nucleosynthesis that produce elements in different ratios that all combine together in some form give us what we see around us? Um, so these are still, I would say, open questions. Um, rates are very much an open question as well, and people are arguing for lower limits, upper limits. Um, they're all in the right ballpark, roughly, order of magnitude, back of the envelope. But the details are all uh, very much uh, open. In fact, there are several papers that based on that early data, the first three weeks of data claim that we only saw elements in the first peak. There was nothing really in the second and third peak. It's wishful thinking if, if you think you, your data needs the second and third peak. Um, and then NASA's Fritz Space Telescope saw, saw, saw something, um, this little red dot here, which I don't know if you can see at the back there, uh, but it, it detected GW170817 43 days and 74 days after merger. And this detection of um, such late time, very, very red emission, uh, was another piece of evidence that suggested that, no, there should have been elements in the second and third peak. Even if, even if there's a small quantity, there needs to be some of them. Otherwise, you would expect no emission out to such a late phase, months after the merger. And this, should, this whole thing should have disappeared in uh, just a couple of weeks. Um, so, so far, I've been telling you guys a lot about the, the central part of the electromagnetic spectrum, the UV, the optical, the infrared, right? Um, so what about the other pieces of the electro electromagnetic spectrum? What do we learn from the gamma rays, the X-rays, the radio, right? What do the two extreme ends of the electromagnetic spectrum um, teach us? So um, the second question that, uh, that we can make some progress on is jet physics and whether neutron star mergers are indeed progenitors of short hard gamma ray bursts. Uh, so um, you'll be learning how to analyze X-ray data in a session by uh, Dr. Brad Senko here and radio data by, with, uh, with Dr. David Kaplan uh, in road school sessions 11 and 12. This is on um, day three here. So this, is, this piece of the, the puzzle is something that is unique to these two extremes in the electromagnetic spectrum. There's no other way really to probe it. So let me explain what this question is and go into this into some more detail here. So um, one of the th debates, early debates that happened with this particular event was that, okay, we saw two neutron stars merge, and we saw uh, a burst of gamma rays that was two seconds long. But was this actually a gamma ray burst, right? Um, so who knows what, what is a gamma ray burst? Can somebody tell me what's a gamma ray burst? You're not talking a bunch, are you? 
We're very sleepy. We need more coffee. <laughs> okay, gamma reversed. Somebody who's not a Caltech student or postdoc needs to answer this. Dhruv, what is a gamma reversed? Right, so there are two flavors. So the kind of gamma reverse that Dhruv is talking about is um, the core collapse of a very massive star. It's called a collapsar that can give you a long duration gamma ray burst. Um, there's another flavor of gamma ray emission, which comes, which is of the short duration, which is which people didn't know what the engines were. Right? People hypothesize that maybe these could come from neutron star mergers. There could be two neutron stars. It could be a neutron star black hole, or it could be something else. Right? So people didn't really know what the engines were, but since the 60s, since the launch of the Vela satellite, people were consistently seeing with gamma ray satellites, patches of gamma rays in the night sky. Okay? So uh, typically when gamma ray satellites would see a flash of gamma rays, it would be because there was this, this relativistic, ultra-relativistic jet. Okay? So who can tell me what's Lorentz factor? What is a Lorentz factor? What is big gamma? Kara, do you want to help me out here? Something moving really fast. David. You want the, the num 1 over square root 1 minus. Right, theta. right. So people get tired of saying, you know, something's moving fast. People get tired of saying it's 0.99999. Nine, 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 right? How many nines you actually put up to see and remember how many nines there are, right? So instead, what people doing special relativity and general relativity use is 1 over square root of 1 minus v square over c square. So that you can then talk in terms of this unit called gamma. And something that's ultra relativistic has a Lorentz factor gamma of 100. So that's, that's at 4 or 5 nines after the 0.99 something C. So just things moving super duper fast um, that are collimated, right? So they're collimated as in they're, they're in, a, in a jet shape. They're not emitting in all directions. So when you're looking down the barrel of, of the jet, you see a bright burst of gamma rays. Because that's what a normal gamma ray burst that a gamma ray satellite detects. Now in this particular case, um, there was a bit of a problem because even though a burst of gamma rays was detected by the Fermi and the integral satellites, it was very, very wimpy. It was extremely weak. It was a factor of 10,000 times less uh, luminous than a typical ordinary uh, gamma ray burst. So people said, okay, it, it's not really uh, a gamma ray burst where you're looking down the barrel of the jet. You're looking just slightly off axis, okay? So if you look, look slightly off axis, the emission fades by to the fourth power of theta, right? So it, it can become weak very, very quickly. So even if you're, say, five degrees off axis, um, you could get much, much weaker emission, and that could explain the gamma rays. Now, if you were just slightly off axis, that's good. You can explain the gamma rays, but you still have a problem because for the first nine days, there was absolutely no X-ray emission detected and no emission detected, which was a big problem, right? Because you could gamma ray bursts, show your burst of gamma rays, and then these really bright X-ray and radio afterglows that are hard to miss. And in this case, this didn't happen in our backyard. It was only at 40 megaparsec, right, which is very, very nearby. People are finding gamma ray bursts out to redshift of 9 <coughs> is the record now, right, Brad? 8.2. Okay, 8.2. Um, so very, very far away. So 40 megaparsec is really, really a backyard. So how can you miss the emission even if you were slightly off axis? It didn't make sense. So the fact that people were not detecting anything in the X-rays and radio suggested that the Earth was really here and it was so far off axis that you missed the X-ray and radio emission, okay? Now, at least right now, all our telescopes are on the same planet, right, or around the same planet, so you can't have two lines of sight to the same event, right? So we have a bit of a problem here. So does anybody know the solution? Friends in an alien civilization with a telescope? So it's not an on-axis short gamma ray burst, and it's not a canonical slightly off-axis gamma ray burst because there are two surprises that just don't mesh together. They don't give you a self-consistent picture as to what this thing is. Um, and the third surprise was that the UV emission... So, three minutes? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the third surprise was that the UV emission was incredibly bright and blue. Okay. So people came up with different ideas to try to explain what this is. Uh, when existing models fail, people come up with new ideas, new models, right? 
So, um, so I just told you Lorentz factor of 100 is what defines this, this canonical short hard gamma ray burst. So what um, some brilliant uh, theorists, in particular Udina Kar and Or Gottlieb and others uh, came up with was that the emission in this particular case was coming from um, a cocoon of emission that was much wider angle and much lower Lorentz factors. So Lorentz factors of only few to ten. So this is mildly relativistic. Now so mild that, you know, we're talking about 0.9 C still, which is not putting four, four nines after the C. Okay, so mild is a very relative term. It's still very, very relativistic. It's just milder compared to a gamma ray burst. And the fact that it's wider angle, and um, uh, this could happen if you have, two, say, two neutron stars merging, and there's so much material around each other, that when the jet launches, it transfers some of this energy into the surrounding material. Um, you could form this wide angle, mildly relativistic cocoon, that when this cocoon breaks out, you could see this very wimpy burst of gamma rays. And because it takes longer to reach um, the interstellar medium to interact, you could see a delayed onset of the radio and um, X-rays here. So people got really excited about this model. Lots of fantastic papers were written and are being written. Um, and then the question was, okay, so you form some sort of cocoon that's explaining this early emission, but what happened to the jet that gave birth to the cocoon? Did the jet survive in this case, or did the jet get choked? And people continue to monitor it, right? I mean, I mentioned to you that the latest infrared emission seen was at 74 days. Um, and that's it. There was nothing else seen after that. But the radio emission kept go going for almost a whole year. Um, and in the radio, you could see this, even though it didn't start till, um, till about 13 days here, um, it kept rising and then turned over here. And this emission lets you work back into what the jet physics is. And in fact, it was uh, in this particular case, it seems like there was a wide angle cocoon, but the jet did survive, and a very narrow but powerful jet did escape out of the cocoon, right? So people were able to tie the picture together, combining the information across the electromagnetic spectrum by looking at two neutron stars merging around each other. This is a cartoon, by the way, lots of material um, in this area. The jet being launched, the cocoon being formed, the radioactive kiln over here, going from blue to very, very red, and then interacting with the endocellar medium, giving you this radio and X-ray emission, which is a citrotron and inverse Compton emission. And you would be able to do all of this by the end of the summer school. Okay? You would be able to analyze data across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. That's the goal of the next three days. All right. Hopefully that's motivating enough and didn't put all of you this. Okay, thanks. Let me take some questions. Yeah. No, please, yeah, you had a question. Sure. The challenge with Fermi is that the localizations that it's capable of generating are quite poor. So it's when it detects the GRB, it can typically only tell where on the sky it was located to, let's say, a border for short GRBs of 200, or in some cases even a few thousand square degrees. So if you wanted to go back and look and say which one of these could be nearby, you have a large number of nearby galaxies in any area on the sky that's a few hundred to a few thousand square degrees. So what people have done more recently is go back and look at maybe the very few specific signatures in the gamma ray signal. If you look at the gamma ray light curve from the event, it shows a very short hard spike and then a longer, sort of softer lived tail of emission. Looking for a combination of those things that you know have been um, both from the spectrum, the temporal evolution, and possible association with the nearby galaxy. It may have seen one or two of these, and it's really hard to pick out uh, amongst the larger sample events that are up there. All right, who needs coffee? <laughs> okay, for a couple of, you're not allowed to ask a question, but Alexander, you can. <laughs> how does the uh, cocoon model change how off-axis it was thought we were? Oh, that's a great question. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. Um, so um, using the radio data, actually, 
um, using the fact that the light curve turned over here. And another um, piece of information, which is how the uh, VLBI data, how the, the shape of the, the cocoon was actually expanding, people were able to work out the geometry very well. And I think it was 23 degrees of axis, plus minus a few degrees, is what the viewing angle turned out to be. And the cocoon is wide angle, right? So it could be anywhere 30, 40 degrees doesn't matter. Um, so, but people were really able to constrain the, the viewing angle, the geometry of the jet. Jet was very, very narrow. It was only five or ten degrees um, narrow, um, and it was a combination of emission from the jet and the cocoon that can explain all this richness. But I think we're a few minutes behind, so I'll take questions over coffee. Um, and uh, why don't you guys get coffee and get ready for your first module um, by Professor Dan Forley? <laughs>